Naval Ravikant says, if you're going to live in a city for 10 years, if you're going to be in a job for five years, if you're in a relationship for a decade, you should be spending one to two years deciding these things. Buying a business is a major decision and you should be spending a lot of time thinking about, not necessarily one to two years, but a lot of time thinking about the right business for you. So this is an exercise I always go through with people who are thinking about buying a business. The purpose is to make sure that you enjoy the business that you buy. And on top of that, it's to narrow your search when you're using the various tools, the various online marketplaces, so you can, you can focus in on the business that you wanna buy, and ultimately, to not waste your time or the seller's. With any big decision in life, there's three big questions that I always ask. First is, where do I wanna be? Location, we're gonna go into each of these in a moment. Who do I want to be with? Lifestyle. And what do I want to do? What industry do I want to be in? So that's what I call beginning your search with clarity. It's location, lifestyle, industry, income, and whether to have employees or not. So, first of all, location. I have four major categories here. Office-based or location-dependent businesses. Remote, meaning you can do it anywhere in the world. All you need is a laptop, an internet connection. Or do you want something that's client-based? Something where you have to travel either within the country, within the state, within the, within the world, travel is required. Or do you want something that's home-based where customer comes to you at your place of residence? So office-based, location-dependent ones, examples are a, a restaurant, you have the kitchen, you have the place where the customers sit, and you have to have a location for the customer to come to. Another example would be a laundromat. You have all the equipment in one place, it's in a big room, the customer has to come to you in order to run that business. And a third one would be a car wash. You have, again, all these come down to equipment, having big equipment or a central location where the customer has to come in order to receive the service. Remote, most likely nowadays, that's a digital business. It's running a website, a SaaS company, e-commerce, something where it's not location dependent. You don't have a big piece of equipment where the customers have to come to you to do the service. Client site, travel required. This would be something like consulting. You're traveling out to different consulting clients to be on site in order to provide the service. It could be something like construction. If you have a very specialized construction skill where you're going around the country in order to do that service. Or it could be import export where you're traveling to other countries to see the suppliers. If it's agriculture to see the farms, the fourth thing would be home-based business. This is where the customer comes to you. Could be a gig thing like dog sitting, dog training. Could be auto detailing. I know guys who detail cars in their driveway. Customers come to them, they do it right there in their driveway. And I've had, I've taken clothes to be altered by home-based seamstresses. So these are all examples of home-based businesses. And these tend to fall in the sole proprietor category, which I'm gonna talk about in a bit. But if they are, you may be better off starting a business rather than buying it because these kind of businesses don't have a lot to them in terms of the processes, in terms of the build out. So you can set these up at your home without having to buy the business. Now, in terms of lifestyle, I created what I call the active versus passive owner operator versus absentee matrix. This is a concept I've been developing. And essentially we have on the X axis, active versus passive and on the Y, Axis absentee versus owner operator. Active versus passive is are you making decisions for the business? Absentee versus owner operator is are you involved in the business on a daily basis? Are you giving it your time? It's a subtle difference, but I'll explain as we go. So in the bottom left corner, the archetype is the employee. You're essentially an employee who happens to own the business. This is active owner operator role. The con is that this is the highest time and energy demand of all the quadrants. It means you're gonna be spending a lot of time in the business. Again, for all intents and purposes, you're an employee. You're there ringing up customers, you're answering phones, you're doing the dirty work. The pro to this is that these businesses have the lowest valuation because they're the least desirable. Don't completely rule these out because many owners start here for the fact that it's the lowest valuation. And then you can progress through the quadrants over time. And some owners are happy to stay here. For example, mechanics. Some mechanics just love what they do and they're happy to just be the owner and work in the business. 
they never plan to hire somebody to replace themselves. That's perfectly valid too. But that's why we go through this exercise. So you have clarity on what it is you're looking for. In the bottom right, the quadrant here is an owner who has hired a general manager to run the business for them. They're still operating in the business. Maybe they're giving it five hours, 10 hours, 20 hours a week, but they have a general manager to do most things. It's somewhere between semi-passive and passive. You're still coming into the business and you might still be making some decisions. Even if you start as an in the employee quadrant, you can get here over a few years by building trust with an employee, by training someone up, grooming someone to be a manager, or just hiring a manager right off the bat and developing the processes needed for that business to run without you. Moving on up to the passive semi-absentee category, this is extremely rare to be here. I've only seen it a handful of times. You'll often hear people say there is no such thing as truly, truly absentee passive. This is where the business runs without you, where you're not making any decisions. Your managers got it. You have full trust in your managers to run the ship. I've seen it a few times in various businesses where the owner hasn't come in in years, where the owner has not had to talk with the managers other than to get an update periodically. This is, for most people, the most desirable. And as a result, these businesses have the highest valuations. As a result of being the most desirable, these deals often get sold off market. So before they even hit a site like Biz Buy Sell, these often sell by business brokers or to the owner's friends because they're great opportunities if you, if you find one of these. In the top left, we have the investor archetype. This could be a board member, an investor, an advisor, a partner, a mentor. It's somebody who has provided capital, but isn't providing a lot of time. And they might be providing input. They might be helping to make decisions or steer the ship to an extent, but they're not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of that business. Typically, these tend to be older people, people with a lot of capital, other businesses. It's helpful to get somebody with a lot of experience who can provide that, like I said, mentorship and teach you things if they're in this role, but not actively providing sweat equity to the business. That is the active passive matrix. It's not perfect, but you get the idea. A lot of people start in the employee category and they work their way up, eventually hoping to get to a passive income type of situation. So one question to think about is if you are starting as an active owner operator, how long would it take you to get to an absentee place, to get to where you're not needed in that business on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is easier with some businesses than others. For example, an automated car wash. The machines are there. You might have a vending machine that dispenses the towels, that dispenses the soap, and then cars just drive through the machine. It gets, it gets washed, it gets shampooed, it gets dried. Everything's done just from the equipment. On the other hand, something like a restaurant, which is extremely labor-intensive, there's a lot of turnover. There's a lot of different people involved. There's a manager, there's waiters, there's kitchen staff, there's a chef. It's much more difficult to get a restaurant to a passive state. So think about that. How long, if you bought the business you're considering, would it take to get to an absentee situation, if that's your goal? And next, consider the hours that are required to run this business and the impact on your other commitments. If you have a job that you intend to keep, if you have family, if you got to drive your kids to school, if you have hobbies, how will this business fit in with the lifestyle that you want to live? And always ask the owner, always ask the seller, how much time do you devote to this business on a weekly basis? And whatever they tell you, add on to it. Add 10 to 50%, at least initially. Because keep in mind, they're trying to sell you this business, so they're going to sugarcoat it a little bit. They're going to tell you, things that make it sound a little more desirable. And on top of that, they've been at this for a while. So they know the systems, they know everything streamlined, they have their processes. When you come in, you're gonna have to figure things out for yourself. So add some time on to whatever the owner says that they currently devote to the business. And I got this question before, is there a way to prove how many hours the owner worked? And there's really not. You can only really take their word for it. And like I said, add a little bit to it because you're going to have to figure things out as you go along. And then the, th the other thing to consider with the hours is what are the quality of those hours? Are they nighttime? Is the business open 24 seven? Are they weekends? Are they going over holidays? Is the business seasonal? Are you only gonna be working in the summer? Are you gonna get bored in the winter if that's the case? Or is it a regular nine to five? 
you know, keep in mind the rhythm of a lifestyle that you want in this business. Okay, next, industry. What do you enjoy and find meaningful? Maybe you already know exactly what you want. If you already know what you want, maybe it's a bar, maybe it's a restaurant, whatever it might be, then you can skip over this section. You already know what industry you want to be in. But if not, here's some useful questions for you. What do you enjoy and find meaningful? What kind of work do you want to do? On top of that, where do you have experience? And it might not be that you've ever worked in anything like that before, but skills like management, marketing, customer service, and budgeting all transfer into the SMB world. So things you've done before, even if it's not directly in that industry, carry over. And then third, what do you not enjoy and want to avoid? Picture yourself doing the dirtiest work at that industry, in that job, because at some point you will. It might be scrubbing toilets. It might be mopping the floors. It might be in my doggy daycare business, picking up dog poop, a lot of it on a daily basis. So just know that you are the owner, but doesn't mean you might not get dirty from time to time. And think about that. Think about the worst case scenario of the kind of work that you might be doing. Income. I want you to think about two numbers here. A survive number and a thrive number. With the survive number, what do you need to pay your mortgage? What do you need to put food on the table? Continue paying health insurance to cover some unexpected costs. Have that number in mind. The SDE or the cash flow that you get from the business you're thinking about acquiring needs to be higher than whatever your number is. It needs to be higher with a margin of safety because the business, even if it's done well in the last three years, Something like COVID could happen and the business loses 50% in your first year, 50% of its, its normal revenue. Are you prepared for that? Have a margin of safety so that you're not completely ruining your financial future by buying this business. Okay, next, what do you need to thrive? The opposite of that, if your survive number is 50,000 and your thrive number is 500,000, can this business reasonably get you there? If not, what would it take? More locations? Would it take adding more businesses to your portfolio? More product services? Would it take increasing the number of sales or raising prices? Just know that if, if your financial goals are important to you, you're reaching your Thrive number, then this business should be part of a strategy to get you there. Next, whether to have employees or not. Hopefully, if you're thinking about running a business, the answer is yes, you want employees. Because if you don't, it's not truly a business. Business is about processes. It's about delegating. It's about using leverage through labor. But if you're a sole proprietor, which is best for someone that's like a consultant or a coach, someone that's like an independent artist or ind individual professional service providers, then you should probably be starting a business under your own name rather than buying one. You're a lot better off because your, your brand is yourself. And if that's the case, just become a sole proprietorship. You don't need to go down the, the route of employees. But if you want to manage a team, consider the weight of responsibility for providing people's paychecks, providing people's livelihoods. It's not something to take lightly. If you're in a labor-intensive business, consider that and know that you will be hiring, yes, and you will be firing. If you don't, your business probably won't succeed. Managing people is messy and complex, but when you get the right people and you train them correctly, it can really make or break your business. This is where you want to be. As a business owner, you should be focused on building up a really good team. But consider this in your calculus. Are you prepared to shoulder that responsibility? And then along those lines, are you going to have friends or family involved? Some people work with their spouse. Some people partner with their best friend. Some people hire their siblings. Whatever it is, lay out a clear operating agreement and have rules of engagement because I've seen, I've seen relationships dissolve within a business. If there's a dispute, it can be very emotional and very hard to overcome. So have clear operating agreement, have a clear way to uh, resolve disputes should they occur if you decide to involve friends or family. Okay, with those out of the way, it's time to assemble your acquisition vision. And I'm going to drop a link to a Google Drive in the description where you can download a document that has an acquisition vision template. So you can go through this exercise. 
And these are just examples. So within the lifestyle category, you could say something like, I have 40 to 60 plus hours per week to contribute to this business. That would be being an operator. You're going to be full time. It's going to be your number one focus. Next to that, you could say something like, I have 10 hours per week for this business. That would be in the semi-passive category. Or you might say, I have no time. I will hire a general manager to run the business. Or I have no time. I'm only an investor. Something like that. Just be clear on the lifestyle that you expect out of this business. The income. Again, your survive versus thrive number. Say, I need, uh, my, my survive number, I need $50,000 per year to meet my expenses. If this business is gonna be your only source of income, then factor that. But if this is a supplement to say your spouse's income or some rental income you have, whatever it might be, then factor that in. But then have your, your thrive number. But 150,000 would be ideal, that type of thing. And then the industry, you could say something like, I have a background in construction. I want to do something in that area. I want to do home remodeling. Or I am a chef. I want to own a restaurant or I am open to learning a new industry. I am agnostic about where I go. As far as employees, you can say something like, I want a business that already has five to 10 employees, or I want a business with only one employee, but I plan to hire three more in the first 12 months. With all of these, the more specific you can be, the better. It's also okay to be general if you don't know. Like with the, I'm open to anything in the industry type of situation. And then lastly, with the location, must be within 10 miles of a certain zip code, or it could be a region. You could say must be in Southern California, for example, must be remote, or I am open to anywhere in the US. I will relocate and go to wherever that business is. With all these in mind, you are ready to begin thinking through your acquisition vision, a key step in beginning your business search. I hope you found this useful, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks, bye.